safety stuff. Um, where the lifts are, that's where the toilets are. If you need to go to the toilet, you need to get one of these little um, cards that are on the back door. thing. If you don't take that card, you can go into the toilet, but you can't get back <laughs> and you might have to spend the night there. So <laughs> take the card. Um, the fire escape's down there as well. Just And we're saying welcome New Zealand because it's not just Auckland. We're doing a live stream to whoever wanted to Dial in. How many people have we got? Now? We have 12 attendees online. Excellent. All right, so we're going to record this. I'm sure none of you mind. This is just a call out for one of our partner user groups. So, as it functions with Azure DevOps, please register. And Will is over there. He's the man himself. He will be presenting. So. Feel free to join. Uh, we've also got a, a dev community. That, uh, go and have a look at that. You get nice little uh, newsletters and meetups and all kinds of things like that. And of course, Microsoft Learn step by step training just about across the whole of Microsoft. Give it a whirl and learn new stuff. It's, it's quite Okay, so uh, is there another slide off this? Oh, sorry. So this, oh. this is the end of these slides, right? Yeah. Like swap over. Small technical glitch. Okay, so I'm Rory. I'm a Microsoft Identity Architect. I'm also a Microsoft MVP and Enterprise Mobility, which is where identity sits in those categories. You can find me on Twitter and all over the place at AdWarbrayB. And I use Authory to collate all my blogs. And if you're interested in identity stuff, there's a contact me button there. Just uh, speak up a little bit. Yeah, I to hear you back here. Feel free to, to contact me. So for those who haven't heard, I worked at Datacom for a number of years, but I have left Datacom. I'm now self-employed. Uh, I work part-time, so I work four days a week. And I try and do about 20 hours a day, 20 hours in a week. So I'm kind of moving out of the thing, but I, I just consult all over the world about identity. So. The problem with identity at the moment, right, is that we don't own it. I don't know if you saw the thing in the paper about the, when the uh, James Cook tercentenary came up, uh, they asked volunteers to come and you know, help organize all the events, and they asked them for passport numbers, also, you know, driver's licenses, and that kind of stuff. That database got hacked, uh, and 
one of the women who volunteered had an impeccable credit record. She decided to buy a house. She went to the bank and the bank turned her down. She found the bank and said, what the hell is going on? And they said, oh, you owe all this money on all these credit cards that are bouncing. And she said, no, no, I don't. And after being investigated, you find out someone who got their database, taken her identity, and was spending all of, or trying to spend her money. And it took her a year to get her identity back. And so wow. it's just, that's what happens. The other problem with their identity is that Twitter, Facebook, and all the, and Google, and say, they change the terms and conditions and you don't read that fine print and then you know, your attributes are going to places you don't want it to go. You never actually, you never thought that you would read it, but actually you did because it's sub paragraphs 433. <laughs> and no one reads the terms and conditions anyway. So. The idea of decentralized digital identity and verifiable credentials is that we are going to own our own identities. So you own the identity, you decide, use it where it goes and hopefully that will stop all of this. Here we go. That will stop all of these problems that we're having. Okay, so some notes. I'm going to be talking about decentralized identity, but I'm going to be talking about it from a Microsoft perspective. There's a whole lot of open standards that people have implemented. Different companies have done it in different ways. So because I'm a Microsoft identity architect, I'm going to be telling you about the way that Microsoft has identified it. It is all based on open standards and Microsoft is a major player in the forums, um, getting it up and running. The information in terms of putting this public and public preview came out less than a month ago. So this is really brand spanking shiny new stuff. Uh, as far as I can make out, there have been 10 meetups in total worldwide on this topic. And this is apparently the first one in the whole Lake region. There's one in Sydney, but that's the end of the month. So. As usual, we're ahead. <laughs> so, yeah, we're all still learning. Uh, I didn't quite realize how much stuff there was to get my head around before I decided to do this talk. One of the things that I found really difficult was that because it's so different, there's no a frame of reference that you can refer to. You know, you, if you normally I look at something in OpenID Connect, I, I know OpenID Connect, I can kind of relate this new protocol to the old one. This stuff is all brand new. At the moment, to run it and play with it, you need an Azure P2 license. That is not going to be the case going forward, but that's how they've implemented it. So at the moment, that's how it is. And as I said, went into public preview uh, less, than a, less than a month ago. All right. So forestry defines decentralized digital identity. It's not just a buzzword, it's a complete restructuring of the currently centralized physical and uh, digital identity ecosystem into a decentralized and democratized architecture. And it's basically a trust framework which identifies such as usernames can be replaced with IDs that are cell-phoned, independent, and enable data exchange using the blockchain and distributed ledger. So the reason that they use things like the blockchain is because no one owns it. So they've tried to put this in an environment where everything they're doing is, is open, doesn't belong to anybody. There's a whole lot of open standards that, uh, that use this stuff. I haven't uh, read them all yet. If you're kind of looking for some bedtime reading, well, there's a nice long list that'll keep going right through winter. Is the de so Microsoft is a member of the Decentralized Identity Foundation and they're the control group across the whole thing. <coughs> we have uh, SciTree, which is the network protocol on top of uh, distributed ledger, and there's a whole lot of other standards um, that together give you the system. Now, ION, the Identity Overlay Network, is Microsoft's instantiation of the SciTree protocol, and it runs in where else? As a Kubernetes service. So everything is Kubernetes. You know that joke about the answer to everything is Kubernetes or blockchain, or this does both. <laughs> uh, and so and don't get confused. Although it yeah, you know, it's not a blockchain, it's it's above the blockchain. And although it runs on Bitcoin's blockchain because they thought that was a, you know, probably one of the most stable ones out there. Iron and distributed identity is not a cryptocurrency. So there's no cryptocurrency, there's no financial stuff, there's no Bitcoin, anything. They're simply using the, the 
distributed ledger and the blockchain as a as a trusted way of storing data. You don't have to use Ion. You can uh, download your own instance and run it on a nice big server if you've got one. Or of course, it runs in blockchain. Now that is a, a diagram that shows you the side tree protocol. So that is what Ion is. Ion implements this. I uh, haven't gone through this in great detail, so I'm not going to do it now. But it just gives you some idea of what's there. You know, it's, not, it's not simple stuff. There's a ton of stuff going on in that slide. And that's the Ion layer of distributed identity. So when we get to verifiable credentials, so we've kind of got the basics now. We've got distributed ledger, we've got Ion. We've got Microsoft building their instantiations, the, the SDKs and all that kind of stuff that we use, but they are not storing the data. The verifiable credentials are data objects, basically claims which attest information about a subject. They include the DID and there's a digital signature. So it's much the same as claims now, which are signed in a JSON web token or a SAML token or whatever, except they sign by keys that are stored on the blockchain. So Microsoft implementation, we have an, an instance in Azure where we are running the ION network. We have a whole lot of developer tools. So the question then is, where are we actually storing your information? Because we can't be storing it inside Azure because then Azure own it. Where can we store it? What can we use? is going to give us a secure storage to run verifiable credentials. And the answer is this. This, you own this, you control it. So they've extended Microsoft Authenticator, which I'm sure a lot of you use because you probably all hopefully use MFA. <coughs> and they have extended that to, to control it. So all the private keys of the verifiable credentials sit in your phone. So the only place on the planet that the keys sit. And obviously there are protocols and forums and things that are investigating what happens if you lose the phone, if your phone gets stolen, if your phone just packs up, you buy a new phone. Uh, obviously that's critical because it's just kind of like you know, blockchain. If you lose the password to your wallet, you lose all the Bitcoin. And there's some hard drive in some dump in America that <laughs> Five million dollars worth of Bitcoin. But the guy's lost his hard drive, so he's lost all that money. So these various uh, scenarios, you can use it to validate information. You can use it to access applications. And obviously, the whole self-service account recovery and all that good stuff. Although it's only just come out, it's being used by people just to kind of prove the uh, the way it works. And with Microsoft, there's quite a few partners. I'm not familiar with any of these, but there are companies right now that are using this technology. <clears throat> right, so if we look at what, how it works down the bottom, it's got DID. So the namespace always starts with DID and then your implementation. So it's DID, ION, and then all the DID stuff. And that's running on the ION network, which as I said is an AKS. We've got for a user, there's got a whole lot of microservices. We have the Authenticator app, which basically ties it all together. We use OpenID Connect to talk to Azure AD. In Microsoft's implementation, you do have to authenticate. And it introduces a new kind of JSON Web token called a self-signed token. So it's much the same as a self-signed certificate. And then we have the credentials, which are, which are portable, and they speak to our whatever APIs. So let's look at a simple scenario. So under the bottom, we've got ION distributed ledger. We've got a company called Woodgrove. Now, Woodgrove have a lady called Alice who works for them. And they decide that they are going to give Alice a verifiable credential. So you can see here on the left-hand side, it's did Woodgrove, the subject is Alice. The claim is that she's been employed since 2020, and it's signed by Woodgrove's issuer. Woodgrove has signed it as an issuer. Private keys are sitting on Alice's phone. The public keys are written down to the distributed ledger. Now we've got Prosware, so they're an issuer. Alice is the user. We've got Prosware, who's the verifier. Now Prosware, let's say, is a bookshop. And if you work for Woodgrove, you get a 20% discount. So 
you go, to Alice goes to Proswear and they say, oh, your employer, and she shows them the verified credential and it's signed by the issuer and it's signed by Alice. So it proves that it came from Woodgrove and it proves that it belonged to Alice. And yes, it's all well and good. You can look up all the public keys from the ION network and you can basically get your 20% discount. So there are three roles here. There's an issuer, Growth, the user is Alice, and verifier who is Proswear. There's always three players in the chain for these verifiable credentials. Okay, so the infrastructure. So the parts of Azure that I have implemented, because I haven't implemented the whole thing because it's just too much. The keys are stored in Key Vault. We're using Blob Container to store all the rules, and I'll go into that just now. And we have the verifier credentials, um, actual stuff. So, okay, go over here. Yeah. So, here are the key bots, which I'm not going to go into because they're just keys. We have the storage account. Storage account stored in a container. Container. And I have two JSON files. So, these are the files that my phone is reading. This tells my phone what the verifier credential looks like. So there's a JSON file that gives the name and the colors and the images and all that stuff. And there's rules which define what claims are going to be contained in the verifier credential. All that stuff is stored in storage, you know, in the blob storage. And over here is the verifiable credential stuff. Yeah. See, we have so I call it the Azure user group. We've got a tenant. This is the distributed identifier. You can see it starts with did ion, as I said. That is the decentralized identity did of this user group out on the blockchain. Of course, you've got key vault, you've got the signing keys, recovery keys, and you have to look it up with the domain. So that's Azure user group.com. That's not a real user, it's not a real domain, it's not verified or anything, but you don't. You know, you can verify it um, if you're doing this properly, but I wasn't going to buy certificates. In, in real life, would you normally not register it? Or no, in real life, you, 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 you would. Yeah, okay. I'm sure. But that means I would get a certificate. Because then that ties back to Azure. Yeah. Yeah. It proves it's a trusted thing. So there's a whole issue credentials, there's a whole lot of tutorials here. Verifying it, there's a whole lot of tutorials here, and I mean a whole lot of tutorials. It's like they go on one, two, three, four, five, six. And of course, the problem with that kind of nice flow is that if you screw up on three, well, you can't get on to four, which is where I ended up. And you can uh, use the phone. Okay, so there is a whole lot of metadata. This is the metadata that is referred to. So you can see here our claims, first name and last name, uh, IDs, these keys, and all kinds of things like that. And if I go over here, we have like everything else in Azure, we've got a storage explorer, we've got a graph explorer. Of course we have to have an ion explorer. So if I go over here, I just take that out and I go here. So this is our third. This is the DID that belongs to the Azure user group. Probably one of the first places in New Zealand to have a DID. There's also 256 characters. Oh, yeah, so that, what it's done is it's given us this type, it's published, the number of keys, the endpoints, the domains. There's more metadata down here, which is describing this DID um, and the keys and the verification methods and the cryptography around it. And then over here we can see the linked domains. So the linked domain is as you use it. So this is linked to, to that one that I was showing you. Okay. So then we have a whole lot of files. So yeah, so you can download all of this stuff. There is quite a lot of it. It all runs in Node. I'm not a Node expert. We have 
basically a folder structure. So this is this is the folder that does all the issuer. This is the folder that does the verifier. If we look at the issuer, we have the issuer config, and that's where the JSON files are. So these are the JSON files that we uploaded to Blob Storage. If I go and look in the issuer, you'll see there's an app.js over here. There's also an app.js for the verifier. So if I go over here. So if we look in the app.js, okay, sorry, I know what I'm doing. If I go and look at the app.js over here, you'll see over here we've put in the credential, we've got the credential type. So basically, and here is our did. So this is how you tie everything up. You have to work through these files. So when you've done all that and you've got it all working, then you can start to play with it. So in our issue, we run node app.js. Hope it's going to work. So if there aren't any proxies here that are going to screw it up. Um, oh, wait. <laughs> ah, yes, let's see on port 881. Fantastic. Over here. We use a reverse proxy called ngrok. Some of you might be familiar with it. Um, so that's going to listen on port 881, which is the one that the issuer is using. Run that. You'll see it gives us a forwarding address over here. Run. If I go and run that in my browser. So this is the verified credential expeditions. And if I click that, I get a thing that I can scan with my phone. It basically starts putting the stuff onto my phone. And if I go here, do all this one, right? And then I go over to the verifier. Node, same thing. This should fire up something that listens on 8082. Go back to Ngrok. Tell it to listen on 8082. HTTPS forwarding address, browser. Remember, we've just done an issue. Now we're looking at verifying it. So now we're doing verification. That and we're going to get another code that we're going to scan. So those are how the two orbs come together. All right, so that gives you some idea of how it all fits together. Sort of. Wow. This is really hard. <coughs> Dan said you in half an hour, and this is this huge break. Thank you. You did exceptional. <laughs> all right, so we've done a Nickery Explorer. So let's look what happens when you actually scan the stuff, because yeah, I, I couldn't really figure out how to put my phone up. I'm sure there's a way. All right, so we've issued it. We've got the code. Then it asks you to sign in, and you can see that's what a VC looks like on your phone. Um, at the moment, and on the bottom, if you look at it, it's B2C, so it's using B2C to do this login. All right, so you log in, you click Add, all right, and that's what adds the VC to your phone. All right, you now have a VC. So you are now, if you run through the sample, you're now a VC. And if you look on the phone on the right hand side, you'll see there's a new tab, an authenticator, which mm -hmm. says credentials, right? Which is like this is your credentials. It's the only place in the planet where they live. When you verify them, you do uh, you go the same path and it says allow. So you're saying yes, I want to verify. 
it comes up and says you're a verified credential expert, right? And then you get your verified credential. So you've now issued a verified. Now, I did not uh, hook up the domain. So it says this is risky. This is not a certified domain. So you get that thing that you get in the browser and you say, well, let's proceed anyway. And then it goes. So I went and customized everything. And then you see, now I have an ESO user group, verified credential, and you can see I've changed the color scheme. That kind of stuff is issued to me. And down the bottom, you can see ESO user group. It's just warning you, it's not verified. And so now you've all seen this, and you're all experts. So next user group, you'd have to have a VC to get your pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just joking. Um, what was the? Could you go back to the screenshot of the? Um, uh, you had the. Um, authenticator. Screenshot of the authenticator. Where well, you had the. That one. Yeah. So authenticator passwords and. Credentials. Yeah. So okay. that's what's normally the. Okay. Uh, That's all good. And to finish, because yeah, there's a really nice video from Microsoft that you can watch, and it will hopefully tie it all in for you. Thank you. Cool. And that is it. Hope you all learned something. Wow.
Got a question for you, Rory? Yeah, I will try and answer the question, but I'm not an expert on this. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. So we got two questions on the online crew. First one: Do you need to set up Azure AD B2C tenant to set up verifiable credentials, or can you just set up against your default Azure AD tenant? Yeah. So. Like I said, there's this whole list of things and I got stuck and I ran out of time. So I didn't do the last um, tutorial. The last tutorial is exactly what the question was just asked. It's moving it from Azure to your Azure, from B2C to Azure AD. So yeah, you can move it into Azure AD, but I never had time to do that. So you need to set up a B2C first? No, no, it's the B2C is the one that Microsoft has got. Okay. So you can, if you go through tutorials, you can use their B2C. But then the last step of the puzzle is moving the, so you've got your own uh, as a tenant, you've got the VC and the key vault and the blob in your own as a tenant. It's just moving from Microsoft's B2C to using Azure AD in your own tenant. Oh, all good. So uh, thank you very much, Rory. That was interesting. Um, questions around the wallet. The network connection dropped a few times and I didn't get the reasons for the wallet. Uh, who would manage that? Who would manage the wallet? Yeah. So by the wallet, you mean your phone? Is that what you mean? Oh, that, that, that's just a verbatim question. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'm guessing you basically need um, hmm. your phone. So you manage the phone and you, you add the verified credentials, you delete them. You decide who you're going to give it to. You don't want to give it to some guy you don't give it to it's your decision so in the states there is another uh, thing that's working at the moment called milgia so milgia is for uh, army veterans that have left the army and they need to find a job so the army sets them up with verifiable credentials so they go to the army and they show them their high school transcripts the uni transcripts um, you know all kinds of stuff they get a verifiable credential and then Instead of having to put this big pack of stuff and send off to Alabama University and to this university which sits in the post and takes forever, they can just show, you know, find the guy up on the phone or go there and see them and get everything verified instantly. So it helps the, the veterans get employment much, much quicker. So that's actually working right now. And uh, all, all the people are using it. Yeah. How does it work with expiry of stuff like the student ID and the example? I guess that always says like yeah, so I'm guessing, or something, but what if it's like you're an employee of Microsoft but then you quit? Like so I'm guessing that in the you know the, the, the metadata around the VC it will have an expiry date, just like a JSON web token has. Uh, so most smartphones today don't have real TCMs or HSMs. So how uh, how do you see this moving forward in a world where None of the stuff will be secured and will be stored in a secure way because the place where it's stored doesn't have an HSM or a TCM. When you say the place that it's stored, what do you But you're, you're storing it in the phone. And if the uh, phone doesn't have a secure enclosure, a trusted compute module, <coughs> I don't know. Because most phones don't. So. But I'm sure that's something that they will. Sounds like an obvious thing, but how it works. So, Rory, could you like repeat the question? The question was, if there's not a hardware security module in the phone, what is actually securing all the stuff in the phone? I don't know. What happens if I have more than one device and I actually like to share my phone with my cell phone and other device? <laughs> <laughs> what happens if I have more than one device? How does it split across all of them? Yeah, good question. I don't know. I haven't actually seen anything about who pays the cost to register the, the DID on the blockchain? Who pays the cost? I guess it comes from Microsoft. Right? The cost for Microsoft comes from your subscription. So when they get off P2, they are going to go the same way as Key Vault and all those things where basically the more you use it, the more you get. So yeah, that's, that's how that would work. I imagine. So. If it's built on the blockchain, are we going to burn the world even quicker? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If we, uh, if it's based on the distributed ledger and blockchain, does that mean that it's going to push up global warming even more? I guess in a sense, <laughs> yes. But the thing that really screws up uh, in the blockchain.
folks and it's actually data mining. So there's no data mining here because there's no Bitcoin, there's no cryptocurrency. <coughs> How much, how much personal information can you actually store in your wallet? Or like, can you pass it around, for example, your social security numbers, your driver's license, your photos? So, and yeah. stuff. The question is, how much can you put on your phone? Uh, the answer to that, I guess, is as many people as are issuing VCs you can put on your phone. It's an emerging technology. Eventually, hopefully, you have your license on your phone. So the cop pulls you over and asks you to see your license, and you left your license at home. You've got your mobile phone, so you can show it. So yeah, I mean that's just part of the, the adoption part of it. Is, is that that what we just talked about where the data, the metadata is stored, that's actually stored on the iron network, which is like a layer two network, right? Yeah. So it's it, it, what about what what about the other technologies that are around, like you've got things like uh, solid, which Tim Berners Lee came up with for storing decentralized data for people and allowing for authentication or identity that way. Has there been any, is it, does it, are there any links with iron in that respect? Links with iron with what, sorry? It's called solid. It, uh, it was created probably three, four years ago for, uh, by Tim Berners-Lee. So, well, Sir, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. So the, qu the question is, is, what's it called? Solid. 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 It's a the question is, is there any connection between iron and solid? Is there any, like, uh, when you're storing a lot of that, that uh, VC data in the in iron, um, is it actually storing, like, everything or just the, the identity authentication part? I don't think it's storing everything. I think the main thing that it's storing is all the cryptography. Yeah. Because the, the, the information about what your certificate, what your VC looks like and all that is actually stored in Azure. Yeah, so it ends up pointing back to something in Azure for the actual data. I think, I think they're using the blockchain to store the keys because it's yep. like a critical part of the whole thing. Which, yeah, okay. Hmm. So I have a phone, brand new, and I've got it on my old phone. So in normal instances of authenticator, I just transfer the authenticator and I re-authenticate because it's tied to my Microsoft account. Will the authenticator still require a Microsoft account? Are you aware? Does it work with just a work account? Uh, the question is, what kind of account does the authenticator work with? Um, yeah, I don't know. Because I know normal authenticator, you need a Microsoft account initially to set it up. That's why I was. So, uh, when we're using the authentication on the phone and uh, when in the current location, and uh, when you change your location, like other country, when you go and so is the IP is going to conflict uh, uh, the authentication? The IP, because IP also part of it or irrespective, because uh, it's my personal experience is when I change the location, certainly those apps doesn't work because of the IP constraint. So is the is this will happen? The question is, if you go to another country and the IP changes, does that affect? Yes. How it all works? Yeah. I would guess not, but I don't know. So, um, similar to FIDO, uh, do these new protocols protect you somehow against phishing sites? I'm guessing they do, yes, but I don't know about the ones. Like I say, this is that's also brand new. It's just a, I'm only a little bit ahead of you guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question about the claims. Mm. Um, so, I would imagine and I don't know if you know the answer, but um, you'd obviously, if one organization wanted to verify some claim uh, from another organization, uh, they would have to be able to discover those claims. And, and, as, a, and as the uh, person with the identity, I would need to be able to control which claims they exposed. Do you know anything about that? Um, I, so the claims are in those JSON files that I showed you. So you can set up the claims that you used. And in Microsoft's case, when you authenticated your ESC, that's where you get the claims from. I'm guessing that the claims are tied to that DC. It's that whole lot of claims is passed on to verify. But I, I don't see why you can't have different claims. Since they've all got different JSON files, 
So we, we don't have any information at this point. Well, I'm sure in all those, that pile of specs, yeah. it's all there, but I haven't read it yet. So how do you actually end user, like authenticator, you, know, you go to the website, you put it sign, then you just approve on your phone. So with this, what's the end user experience like? You said it comes up with a barcode or? Like I mean, how, how, do you how do you actually, how is how it used? Use it? Yeah, that's a really good question, and I spent a long time trying to find the answer. I was because looking I, for an end-to-end -end use yeah. case. So exactly it, how, they all just say, like that video, that it all just gets approved. Yeah. But how, I didn't actually yeah. see how it's done. Yeah. Like, what do you do? Do you show the phone? How does it see it? Because if you see, you show, and, 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 and it's a barcode, or oh, just copy somebody else's barcode. So barco. that's the bit that I don't get. Yeah, <laughs> there already another question online that said, thank you very much for the great demo. Um, is there any tutorial or link that you could recommend for people to investigate this further themselves? Yeah, so I'm going to put this, so the question is, is there a link for the tutorials and stuff without having to go and get that DC uh, page that I showed you? I'm going to put the slides up on the user group and the slides have got a whole lot of uh, URLs at the end. There's a ton of stuff at the end. I just warn you that it is a lot of stuff. Just to read that stuff took me over a week. I'm not even trying to get to work. It's a lot of stuff. Because they basically have been working on this, put it all together in this huge package, and that's it. Right now it's in public preview. And you guys are just gonna have to figure it out. There's no I didn't see any kind of tutorial or kind of overview or Microsoft Learn or anything like that. It's like day one, literally it's day one. Another question about the uh, ION network. Um, it, I'm not sure if you mentioned it or not, or I must. It. Um, can you connect other chains to ION to use for you know, those authentications and things? So, like, say, for example, if you wanted to store stuff in a decentralized way on, say, Filecoin, which is a decentralized file yeah. store, could so you link that with the. So, kind of like federation. The question was, can you do federation in Ion? And I haven't seen any references to that. But I don't know, but I definitely didn't read about any linking other stuff together. Yeah. So just checking, uh, the, when you get a claim or you get uh, more data of some kind, none of that actually ends up on the blockchain. And none of it even ends up on Ion. It ends up in a, in a vault somewhere. Ion has a reference to that vault, and the blockchain is just like a trust anchor for Ion. Is that correct? I think the question is, where does the data sit? Does the data sit on the blockchain? As far as I know, the only stuff on the blockchain is the cryptographic stuff. It's just really that stuff. Sorry, uh, just to follow on with that. So that kind of means that your data is still stored somewhere, which potentially could be taken by someone other than the identity part of it, but the actual data behind your identity is still stored somewhere that you have to trust that the encryption they've used on a... Well, the, the, so the question is, where's the other data stored? I think most of it's stored in the phone because it's all part of the DC. It's in the in the wallet yeah. that you're talking about, which is I'm a, guessing. I, a I bit different to... It's a little bit different to the uh, standard blockchain wallets. In that respect? Well, if the organization is validating the claim, then they need to hold the the the, the claim. Mm. They just don't link it to the identity directly. It's but it's indirectly. Linked. So that data would be encrypted with the private key that the person is yeah. using. I mean, they would the need identity. to have it, otherwise, they can't validate the claim. Okay. Right, okay. I'm we need to move on. So the last question. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I just want to know, like, when is the service going to launch? Sorry? When is the service, I mean, is it going to launch? When is it going to launch? Yeah. It's launched. It's launched already. It's, it's been around for a while. It's been in private preview for two years or so. Now it's launched and it's there. I, I, I went and made a did for the user group. and I made VCs for the user group. Um, is there anyone in New Zealand that accepts a VC? Probably not right now. Stuff is there, and you can, you can get if, if you've got a P2 as a subscription, you can get other stuff minting all the stuff yourself. <laughs> so, where is 
Okay. Thanks everyone for sticking around. I thought you'd all just disappear after um after Rory, because yeah, I'm gonna have to say decentralized identity is much sexier than infrastructure as code, but hey, we all have to deal with it sometimes. So I'm just gonna go give a quick shout out. We've got another user group. Uh, we have the lunchtime user group as well. Um, and the that's happening next week, and we're lucky enough to have Rob, the um, head of engineering at Aura. Um, also, Rob, that's not Rob, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that um, Rob uh, Shahid works uh, with Rob at Aura. They're going to give a, a talk about their architectural journey in Azure. They really, you know, basically re-architected from scratch two years ago. Spent a whole bunch of time building in Azure, and then went, you know what? We're going to change uh, change this up completely. Scrap the whole thing and rebuild. Um, and amazing architects, amazing journey, and I've got to work with these guys, and they've got really good tech. And it's just, I'm glad I finally got them into a room to talk about this stuff. So yeah, if you if you're interested, that's going to be live stream. It's going to be here again, um, Peter as well. But this one's a lunchtime meetup, so 12 to 1:30. Um, so yeah, my name is Dan. I'm a PT, a partner technology strategist at Microsoft. I've been doing infrastructure as code for a long time. Well, for a while, I've worked with with some of the team here in the audience, and I'm, I'm sure we've all been on the same journey. But I'd just be keen, who, who has used Azure Resource Manager templates? Well, that's, that's awesome. Who likes Azure Resource Manager <laughs> templates? Oh, yeah. I'm going to give Dan's stickers on you, by the way. Um, so, I mean, we, it's, it, was a, it was a stepping stone, right? It was a good, it was a, as, as a technology, it was a good first cut. Um, but we've all written JSON and all, you know, hacked through and are kind of gone, well, we, we think we could do better. Um, so what is BICEP? BICEP is transparent abstraction over top of Azure Resource Manager templates. Uh, basically, it aims to dramatically simplify the authoring experience with a cleaner sy sy syntax, modularity, and, and code reuse. A lot of words. Fundamentally, it just makes ARM um, templates better. Um, it is not a replacement for Azure Resource Manager templates. It is actually an abstraction, which means it transpiles from um, to, from BICEP syntax, BICEP syntax into Azure Resource Manager templates. So the templates still exist. You just don't need to deal with any more, deal with them. You're instead writing in BICEP, and that will then be transpiled and sent to an Azure Resource Manager engine to do the do the work. Um, it is the goal, one of the goals, or many of the goals, one of them was to develop the best possible syntax or best possible language. Um, they wanted to, they thought about YAML, and of course we all know YAML is an awesome, an awesome markup, but it, it isn't perfect either. So they went with a custom language. It actually looks really similar to HCL. So if you have any Terraform, yeah, there we go, Terraform people in the room, you would, at first glance, you look at that and you go, is that, is that, is that Terraform HCL? Um, it's not, but you'd be you'd be for, forgiven for, for looking at it that way. It's also a transparent abstraction. As I mentioned, it's designed to sit on top and they should be, you should be able to compile from bicep to arm and arm to bicep. 
Um, but the problem of compiling from ARM to decompiling ARM to BICEP is, is you'll often have marked up your BICEP to make it easier to read and structure, and, and you can tend to lose some of that. It's, as I said, it's easy to understand, simple to learn, simple to read. Um, it's also designed, and it's, this is not, not there yet, but it's designed to um, integrate directly into the Azure Resource Manager templates. So wherever you can load Azure Resource Manager templates, you should be able to send BICEP. That hasn't landed yet. So for example, you might use Azure Resource Manager templates to do, by, do blueprint, to set up blueprints. Um, you in future will be able to just put a BICEP file in there instead. Uh, but that hasn't happened yet, that's coming. Um, the modularity, anyone here who used nested deployments and all that really nice <laughs> stuff, that is still exists under the hood, but BICEP essentially makes that a lot simpler. So you can create, you know, basically separate module files and when you compile everything together, BICEP will take it all and build it into a, a template and do all the nested deployments for you. So it's way better. And the thing I love the most, especially when you're trying to write this from scratch, validation and type checking. So it is actually a lot, it does a lot better job of, of checking as you're writing BICEP that you're, you know, the types are correct, that the, you know, what you're writing is syntactically correct. And I'll actually demonstrate that in a second. So um, let's just go straight into a demo. So what I was going to do is Use the BICEP Playground. Now, this is a great place to get started. Um, we're going to have a quick look at, at, at the, the template and script. Um, but if you head to, I think it's aka.ms slash BICEP demo, you will come to this, this playground, which is essentially a, a, a space you can go and write um, BICEP code and have it translated into ARM or write ARM and have it translated back to BICEP. Or you can just copy and paste and see, see what happens. But let's take a little bit of a look at the syntax and detail, and then we'll write some bicep. So fundamentally, it still follows the same constructs. You have uh, parameters, again, just like you do in an Azure Resource Manager template file, which are these are inputs to your infrastructure's code. You'll have variables, which are expressions or assignments of, of a value to a, to a variable. You also you will have resources. Uh, added with my mouse because it keeps switching to that screen. There we go. So you'll also have resources. Again, uh, a lot cleaner. And you'll there's also outputs and modules as well. Um, but fundamentally, that's the structure. One key difference between uh, Azure Resource Manager and BICEP. I'm going to stop saying Azure Resource Manager by the way. We're saying ARM templates. But in case you're running, ARM um, sounds exactly like um, uh, so I, I may be pausing for <laughs> effect or I might be saying ARM, um, we'll let you guess. But essentially, yeah, ARM um, templates, you can, you can, in a BICEP file, you can order this in any way you like. If you want to put all the variables at the end, if you want to interlace variables and resources, if that makes more sense, move parameters around, you can do that and, and the BICEP compiler will actually shut everything out. But what I would, now this is a great tool. It's fantastic, it's great to get started. It's actually not as rich as using Visual Studio Code. So what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna head over to Visual Studio Code instead. So I highly recommend this as a tool for editing BICEP. Um, what you really wanna do though, is make sure you've downloaded the BICEP extension because that will give you language support. It will give you, you know, as you type, it will complete, auto-complete and all that sort of stuff. So I've actually got a, a, a nice BICEP file. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select language and just say BICEP. What I'll do is I'll Okay, so here's my new BICEP file. What has happened, as you can see down the bottom here, it does say BICEP. Uh, which means the language engine is, is going to start checking. But what I can do is now just type resource, and of course, Spicer will help me. Um, and then I will type in the name of the resource. So my storage account, I'm going to deploy a storage account. Now, this is not the name of, um, this is not the name of the storage account that will appear in Azure. So you won't see a storage account called my storage. This is essentially defining a variable or an object 
that represents that story. So you can use this in other expressions. So what I'll do is that I'll then type the type. Now, cool, it's going to go and give me in a bunch of options, but I'm just going to go Microsoft Storage, and I'm going to just select Storage Accounts. And it's also helpfully given me the list of, of APIs or versions of the Azure Storage API that is available to me, and I will just select the latest one. Um, and what I'll then do is just say equals. And there's a few other little options that I'm given here, things that are going to get things like for loops and, and also existing, which is another keyword I'll talk about. Later. So what I've done there, now it's giving me squigglies, which is important because basically it's saying this resource is broken because I haven't actually given it a name. So I'm going to give it a name. And this is another important piece. So I'm going to say DSR storage. So imagine it. And my squigglies are still there, and I can actually hover up my mouse over that, and it's going to say what my problem is. So it's telling me I'm missing kind, location, and scoop. So that's cool. But you'll have noticed I've put the name in quotes. That's important here. If you don't, if I take this away, uh, what ICF is going to do is it's going to assume I'm talking about an expression. I'm, I, it's a variable instead. So by default, it assumes that um, it's a it's a variable, and so you need to specify that it's a string. So I'm also going to put a, a kind, um, and I'll put story two, and I'll put location, east, US. Now, of course, I've done that wrong because it's in quotes. And I'll put the SKU, and this is also going to say, okay, the SKU is actually not a variable, it's an object. So it's told me I need to do this, and I also know I need to put name. It's told me across here on the right, if you see the name, that it's required. So I'll now just select standard LRS. So that is essentially me defining a storage account. So it's a lot easier. I'm going to save this. Save it. I'm actually going to apply a different one later. Demo.bicep. Okay. So that's a storage account. It's pretty simple, straightforward. You know, you hopefully will can see the comparison between the ARM template version and the, and the bicep one. But what I would normally do here is go, well, okay, I need to parameterize my um, my storage account name. I want to pass that in. So I want my to be able to pass in the parameter of the storage account when I deploy this. So I'm going to go param, I'm going to say my um, storage, storage account name, string, String, sorry, failing. And I could also give that a, a default. So I'm going to say storage. Okay. You have a typo? Name. Name. <laughs> yes, I have a typo. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, so what I would then do is then, of course, just replace that with that. Now, if I had done main here, um, it'll give me squiggles, of course, as you expect. Um, so that's a parameter. Now, what I would also do is I might actually, I'm going to parameterize the location as well. So, param uh, location string east west. But I actually want to um, specify allowed parameters. What, what values can I take on? So, I want to say east US. I never want anyone to be able to deploy to anything but west, east and west US. And then, of course, I will. Change my location to location. Simple, fairly straightforward, right? Um, I could, of course, say add a description and say the location of the storage. Okay. But to be honest, um, well, not to be honest, to, to the recommendation from the advice team is don't add descriptions for things that are obvious. <laughs> <laughs> we all know clean code principles. Um, yeah, look. No, if, if we can't figure out what the location is for based on the name of the parameter, then perhaps we need a better parameter name. So, um, in which case, I'm not going to do that. So, I'll get rid of that. so that's that's that. Now, what I would typically do is I'd say, well, actually, we don't want to deploy a resource. We don't want to deploy our, lo our resource our storage account into a into a named location into another location. We have to pass in. We just want to use the resource group itself. So that is where expressions come in. So expressions are where we can, we would normally, if you're familiar with the ARM template expression format, like quotes and square brackets and 
functions and it ends up a nasty mess and you don't end up with any good syntax highlighting. Instead, what I don't, I now need to do is just simply go resource group, which is the resource group object that I'm going to be deploying, that I'm actually, that will be deploying this um, object, this um, storage account, and then I will just put brackets and the location. So if you'll recall Azure Resource Manager templates, the, the format of that was much uglier. So this is much easier and much, much simpler to read. So that's that's the fundamentals of it. But what we're also going to do here is I'm going to quickly, I'm going to parameterize my, my I'm going to do a little bit more with this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go prem prefix. I'm going to add a prefix parameter, um, which I'm going to default to DSR. And I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to, because what I want to do is if perhaps I'm deploying five storage accounts and I want to all have the same prefix. Um, I will create a prefix string and I'll then create a variable. I could, of course, do this straight in here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at string concatenation in uh, I see String concatenation again in ARM was quite horrible. I got a question. Are you taking questions in line or are you? Let's, let's circle back. I will, we'll come back. We'll do question Q&A at the end. Or is it, do you reckon it's a question that needs to ask? Oh, it's kind of, kind of about your typing. Quick ones. Um, in, in your strings, do you have to have single quotes or is double quotes okay? Uh, you need single quotes. So, I think actually it's a good question. I'm pretty sure it's, you can only do single quotes. So, so double quotes, quotes is a no-go. Okay, cool. Um, and then in the, when you type at, is at like an attribute that applies directly to the next object in the file? At, did you say at? Yeah, at simple. So the question there, the question was when you type the at, which is in the, I believe you're talking about this stuff up here, about the. It means the attribute. It was like the describe thing, like a decorator. Kind of deal. Oh, okay, the decorator. Sorry. So, yes, the decorators. So, what was the question about the decorators? Sorry. Uh, is the at like an attribute that applies directly to the next object? That correct. Applies? Yes. Sorry, that is correct. So, does the attribute or the decorator apply to the thing that follows? Yes, it does. So, if you need a, um, you know, if you need to add a description or other metadata or other information about the, the object, so there's a couple of them. There's there's a number of different um, metadata depending on the, sorry, not metadata attributes depending on the. Um, depending on the object that follows. For example, if I specify a resource, I get the batch size one, which is for, to, for dealing with loops um, and deploying batches of, of resources. Say you have 10 storage accounts and you want to deploy two at a time, you might specify a batch size of two. But that's a that's a more of an advanced topic, but there's a, there are a number of ads. They will, it will be, it will do a smart thing and figure out that what the line is following. But if you want to write your at, and you don't have a line following, it's easier to just, I find it's easier to just write the, the thing and then move up and do the at. Um, so good question. Any other questions or? Can you comment? Is there yes, yeah, oh, 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 good point. Comments were awful and JSON, it doesn't like comments natively. So of course you've got the slash slash comments. Um, um, and I actually had a whole bunch of, I've got a lot of, I'm actually gonna, because I'm terrible at typing, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start copying and pasting. You don't want to watch me type <laughs> all this. I'm going to get rid of that. So I've handily got some stuff like pre-made, um, which essentially is all the steps and they're on the screen here. Yeah. So let's take a look at where we're we at. So uh, step <laughs> four. So we've added the prefix. And of course, as we see, I've added my prefix, prefix. And what I've done here is I've added a, an I've created an expression, and that expression is concatenating those two strings. So it's single quote, then I specify a dollar sign, um, a squiggly brace, and then the variable name. And of course, that's going to get translated into a concat. Um, so obviously, concatenation is a lot easier. So what that will do is that it's going to just combine my prefix, my storage account, base name, and, and put them both together. Um, as you can see, I'm mixing camel case, which I wouldn't normally do. Um, what I would then do is, of course, convert that to a variable. So this is what, why don't I get rid of this entirely? Get rid of 
this. Just click on the, on the icon on the left. Thank you. So you can see some people are working on the tools. Um, so we've got what I've done here is I've created a variable um, with a storage account named full, which is now a combination of prefix and storage, and I've just assigned that uh, to the variable. As you can see, nice, nice commenting. Next step. So what I want to do now is I want to output the endpoint URL um, back out of my infrastructure as code. So I'm going to deploy this storage account. It's going to have a URL, FQDN, and what I want to do is dump that storage account out, which if this was a module, what I would have done is perhaps that might be an output to another script. So I might have a module that deploys a public IP address and I need to get the IP address or the, the endpoint, the IP address, the IP of that IP address, and I might then use it in another, another BICEP um, template. So what I've got here is again, it's a similar format. You've got the output keyword, you've got the name, this is the object that essentially is going to be created. It's a type string. And then of course we're referencing the my storage. So this is an example of where I'm actually referencing the variable name or the, the resource name that I created earlier. Not the actual name that's going to be deployed to Azure, but the actual BICEP name. And I'm specifying properties. So there's a properties object on most resources. I'm specifying the primary endpoints property or object, and then I'm getting blob. That's actually the, the primary endpoint of the blob service. So that's an out, that's that's an output. Lot again, the syntax is nicer, it's a lot simpler. So what about secure variables? So now what I've decided to do is I'm going to go and use uh, bring your own storage account keys. Um, and this is a very facetious uh, demonstration because of course I wouldn't pass a storage encryption key in. That's not how storage encryption works, but I'm just using being facetious. So I, what I've done here is I've created a, a parameter with storage account key, but I've, I've added a secure um, attribute or a, a, a secure decorator. So that will then tell um, Azure to uh, um, template to the, the compiler to uh, make that a secure string and force me to use their appropriate protections. But of course, that's not how you deal with store, um, storage um, account keys. So that brings us to the next super awesome thing that that ICEP has. So often when you're deploying a bunch of resources, you often have resources that already exist. You don't want to deploy, you know, you've got a key vault. Perhaps you put a key vault in your landing zone. You don't want to deal with um, redeploying that because why would you? You're only deploying new stuff, but you still want to be able to use references to that, that deployed resource in your ARM template. And if you didn't, how would BICEF know whether you've, you know, whether the types you've specified and the objects and the properties you've specified are correct? So this gives you, what you can actually do is create a resource and add the existing keyword to the end of it. Now what this tells BICEP is this exists, it is a key vault, it has this name, this name here, and I can now use that key vault or that reference, that KV, in other parts of my BICEP, BICEP file. BICEP will then translate that KV or that, that object and, and do all the right stuff to make this all hang together. So what I've done here is I've added some properties to enable storage key encryption. This is actually how you do do storage key encryption. Um, what I would have added all the properties and et cetera, et cetera. These, this is all standard, stock standard stuff. But what I will then do is add this reference to the key vault URI. And as you can see, I've specified KV, which is the name, which is that um, object, that, that reference, that um, resource reference, here, and I'm specifying the properties and the vault URI. So that will then mean that when Azure Resource Manager, when BICEP goes and validates this, it knows what a key vault looks like, knows what properties are on it, and it will be able to say, actually, that vault URI is valid. If I put vault URI 2, it's going to say, there's no such property on a, on a key vault. So there's actually a little bit more I have to do here, but um, it's it's well, beyond, well out of the scope. Um, if you want to know, it would be, I would have to do it, deal with a whole lot of MSIs, managed service identities. So the next thing I would normally do is let's talk about child resources. So as you are probably familiar, you've got your, you know, in Azure you'll have a, say, a storage account, and then you might have some some resources that are below that, or a, a, perhaps a web app, or 
you might have um, you might have a web config or a, you know a, a site config um, child resource. So BICEP gives you a number of different ways to define child resources. <coughs> there is actually several more. I'm going to show you two, but there are many different ways. I think there's about four or five. Um, and I'll give you resources at the end where you can go and learn all this stuff. It's a pretty, it's super, super simple to get, get started. So the easiest way is to actually make the resource simply within or declare the resource within the actual parent resource. Um, and when I did, when you do that, you just need to specify again a reference. Um, you only need to specify the actual um, sub um, resource providers or the child resource provider object. So I don't need to put in Microsoft stock storage slash blob services slash, slash storage account slash blob services. It'll all fill in for me. So if I decided actually I want to write this again, um, blob, it will actually tell me and I don't need to even figure it out. I just press that and then it calls and we're done. So again what I'm doing here is I'm changing the expression. I'm adding a dash blob on the end and I'm setting up Snapshot policy. So nearly, nearly there, folks. So next stage. So this is basically a whirlwind run through some of the features of of, of bicep. It's not all of them by any means. So again, as I said, there's a different. There's other ways of defining uh, child resources. You can define it within the parent resource, or you can actually um, move the resource outside. But when you do that, you need to specify. Um, both a parent and the full provider name. So what I would need to get done there is I've specified the parent and notice I haven't done that horrible. If you're familiar when you would normally done this, you would have specified resource ID, open bracket, you, this big long string of information. Now all you need to do is specify the storage account that is the parent and by the resource. Two more steps. Okay, so let's now look at loops. Loops was a loops was again was ugly as in, in Azure Resource Manager template was really really nasty, but it was all you know was what the syntax supported. So um, what we have got here is we've now decided I'm going to deploy multiple storage accounts. I I want to be able to pass in an array and have that those expanded and created multiple storage accounts. So what I've done is I've created a parameter with an array of storage accounts. It could be argued that this is probably pretty obvious. Um, what I've then done is I have converted this to a loop, which is again, we have the key, the keyword existing, but we also have this keyword for. We also have a for for um, a counter type for, but we're just going to use a for in. And as we can see, we put a square bracket and we specify the storage, the variable, which is the actual ref, uh, instance variable, the iterator that gets created. Um, and this is the storage account. This is the reference to the parameter that I specified earlier. And what BICEP will do is simply just convert that, um, deploy two of these, deploy however many, and I've got to obviously specify or generate an expression. Um, and I cannot use a variable here because obviously the variable would, would change. You cannot specify a variable inside a resource. So that's that's how simple loops are. There are there is another couple of loops. There's also output loops, which we won't go into, um, which is if you needed to generate an output object with a number of different outputs, an array of outputs, you would use an output loop. But fundamentally, that's all there is to loops. Finally, this is the last set before we, before we finish up. So modules, modules are probably the, the handiest, coolest piece. Um, this is where really I would start to break my, my BICEP files, files down. So I would start to create sub resources. Say I'm deploying a Kubernetes cluster with a log analytics workspace and a, a, key, a container registry and a whole bunch of other bits and pieces. I might break that down into individual module files that I can then put in a subfolder and just make things a lot simpler. So what I've actually done here is I, because this was a new file, I don't have all the sub files, so I'm going to quickly, magic, automatically um, show you what this actually looks like. So what I've got here is I've actually, now this is where I do need this, I've got a module file for public IP address. Now a module file looks very, very sim similar to a normal file, <coughs> it is a normal BICEP file, 
Again, we've got some parameters passed in, we've got some defaults, we've got it's very pretty straightforward, nothing you won't see outside. We've also outputting the IP address or the FQG and the IP address. So that is a module. Now I've chosen to put that in a subfolder called modules. I could put that in a, you know, reference, put it in an HTTP site somewhere, it could be SAS token, but I find given that we're compiling this stuff, it's good to have everything in one place. You might have it elsewhere if you were, say, generating a library and you said we want to have a, you know, our organization wants a library of best practice modules and this is how we're doing things. But I've chosen to do this the lazy, lazy, probably bad way. So all I had to do to use that module is again, I de declare the module, specify again a public, an, uh, the, the object name or the, the reference that I'm going to create, specify the path to the module. Again, it'll take HTTP, whatever you like. And again, it's the same format. What I will then do, these are, this is the name of the, the basically the, the object, and then we're going to pass in these parameters that again, we specify them in the module. <coughs> So as you can see, we've specified these four parameters. And that's how modules work. And there isn't a lot to it. It's, it's pretty simple. Now there's a lot more other things I haven't demonstrated because we've been here forever. And I know you probably go, wow, it's seven, nearly it's 20 to seven, so getting tired. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump back to my presentation. I'm gonna skip a number of these slides because this is basically a, a bit of a wrap up of a summary of all the different changes all the things you can expect to see. I will, I'm will. happy to share this, Pat, but you know, you're probably going to get this in a lot of different places. So this is all the language changes, bit of, bit of summary, but there is more, way more to it. So what do you need to get started? You need the Bicep CLI or the Transpiler that is runs on Mac, um, Linux, uh, Windows, usual, usual places. You can download that via whatever you're your deploy your um your tool of choices. Um, you need if you're doing authoring in VS Code, you need the extension. Uh, you can also use the Bicep Playground, but I said it, it's a it's good for getting started. It's not where you want to do any kind of real authoring. There's also a Bicep and Code Spaces. So if you're using GitHub and you've got access to GitHub Code Spaces, you can actually spin up a code space and have that all fully deployed with all the things you need for Bicep. Um, it's also Bicep is fully integrated into the um, CLI, uh, sorry, into the uh, the um, Azure tools, so AZ and Azure PowerShell. So you can actually just pass all the commands like um, you know new AZ deploy, resource group deploy. You can pass a Bicep file in now, and what that tool will do is find Bicep and and actually download it if it's AC, AZ. It'll download it, do the compilation for you or transpilation and then push it up. The thing to remember, Azure but PowerShell um, doesn't download Bicep CLI automatically for you yet. So 5.6.0 is the latest version. It doesn't do it yet, but you can still pass the Bicep files. There is also a third party open source PowerShell module for messing around with Bicep that does a whole lot of extra stuff. Um, I haven't had a chance to check that in any detail, um, but it looks quite useful. So it looks like it just makes the whole experience a little bit easier. Um, if you're doing CI/CD, which I'm, you know, I'm hoping, I'm hoping you're all considering or doing, there is a Bicep GitHub action uh, available, so um, you can easily do the conversion or compilation of the Bicep files into uh, into ARM templates through that. There's also a DevOps Azure DevOps pipeline bicep task. Again, I think this is third party. Um, there's nothing first party built in yet. That will happen. Um, there are, but anything else, if you, you know, using GitLab or some other tool, Jenkins, whatever, you're going to be able to write a script. So it's not exactly a difficult task. So finally, um, we've been talking about bicep for, for ages and obviously it's, well, it feels like ages, but it's only been about six months. So these are some questions we, we've, we've been asked, or I've been asked a lot. So is Bicep ready for production use? The answer is yes. As of 0.3, which was a couple of months ago, I think you can use it in production and you won't, you know, if you use it in production and you raise a support issue, they will be fine using it. Um, using it. 
can I export templates from Azure portal and biceps and text? Not yet, that is coming. It is planned, so it shouldn't be too long. I'm pretty sure it's gonna be pretty soon. Should I convert all my ARM templates to bicep? Mm -hmm. Probably, <laughs> but it depends. There are a few features, user-defined functions if you're using those in, in ARM that it's not supported yet, but most things will be supported. I'd say give it a go. I mean, it's just so much. I, you know, I'm working with some 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 people who have done that. They've converted everything and had no problems. I've converted some of my really really complicated one, running a couple of issues. There are a couple of caveats, but just give it a try. If if, if it works and it looks clean, um, give it a go. So something in Bicep doesn't work. Raise it in the GitHub repo. So raise an issue. Uh, the team will take a look at it. You may find someone's already raised it. Should I use this instead of Terraform? Both are great tools. Don't use what you're comfortable with, use what you're happy with. If you're using Terraform and you're happy, go just continue to use Terraform. I, we don't recommend one over the other. Is Bicep a declarative or imperative syntax? Bicep is a declarative syntax. Again, just like ARM templates. So I've had this question a few times, which is really, you know, uh, does need to be called out because I think <coughs> we need to focus on deploying infrastructure using declarative syntaxes, not imperative. You know, not, you know, step one, uh, publish the storage account. We want Azure to take care of the, the heavy lifting of deciding what needs to be deployed or changed. So those are the cute, that's all the questions. Oh, what is, what is in BICEP 0.4 and when is that? Um, well, BICEP linter. So that is one of the cool things that ARM templates didn't do very well, and that's linting. So a linter is going to take a look and look at your, take a look at your format, the, the formatting, the style, and common best practices, and give you, you know, as you type recommendations on, on ways you can improve it. So that is coming as in 0.4, and there's probably a bunch of other stuff. And that is coming very soon. I can't say when, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to be real soon. Um, uh, Microsoft Learn modules. So I haven't talked about this. The best place to learn BICEP at the moment is to go to Microsoft Learn. Um, there's three or four modules, maybe four of today um, there. Um, some of them created by, by, by one of our customer engineers, John Downs, who's based over, based over here. Awesome modules um, that are Definitely the best place to start to learn. There are, I think, four of them. The, the new ones that are being that are being worked on are parameters, conditions, and loops, scopes, what if, and linter, and team collaboration. I'm really interested in the team collaboration one. So here's all the resources. Again, I'll share this. Don't need to worry about uh, taking photos. I'll pub publish it on the on the um, on the meetup. And finally. Takeaways, bicep, bicep syntax is easier. It's just better. Uh, I think we can all probably all agree. Again, it's a it's an abstraction, a layer on top of on top of ARM. We've actually, interestingly enough, we've seen some other languages recently being built on top of Azure Resource Manager templates. So bicep is not actually going to be the only way. It's, it's certainly the, the earliest, but there will probably be other languages and syntaxes that maybe work for your particular requirements. And can it be used in production again? Yes, that is probably the best way. So that's it. Rory, over to you. Mate, questions. Oh, yeah, questions. questions. Sorry. <laughs> questions. I've been waiting so long. I've got a sorry. back up of like sorry, six guys. questions. Um, so question number one, can the exist keyword look across subscriptions and resource groups? I was going to ask that. I, that's, so can, can the exist Keyword existing keyword look across subscriptions and other and yes it can obviously it needs access it can you will specify additional information inside the when you define you know the the existing resource and you put in the name you'll need to put in other information to tell um, tell the Azure Resource Manager the, the transpiler where to look and essentially the transpiler doesn't look at anything. So that's important to remember. The transpiler isn't actually looking at Azure to see if that resource exists. What it's doing is saying, well, I know what if such a resource did exist, thumbs up, hopefully. That's what it looks like. That's what the properties it should have on it. So it's not actually going and looking in your, you know, in another subscription for you. Thanks, Dan. Um, question number two. So this looks like a really good way to hide the complexity of ARM JSON. 
uh, and seems to be a lot better than Terraform. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm not going to comment on the Terraform. I mean, look, again, it's, okay. if you invest in Terraform, Terraform is a beautiful language, a very, very powerful tool. It's it's amazing, and I would not, if you've got all this investment, stick with Terraform. It's, it's working for you. If you're starting new, I would absolutely go with Bicep. Um, it's really the people who've gone, I've got a massive investment in ARM and I want to decide whether I should move to Bicep. But yeah, it is. It is a much improved um, syntax. Essentially, it's so much more elegant. But yeah, cool. And here's the second part of it. Um, Pulumi, on the other hand, <laughs> uses a full language, Python, uh, to do infrastructure as code and handles cleanup. How do you feel Bicep compares to Pulumi? Now, this is a tricky one. So, so this is a question for the, about Pulumi. Now, Pulumi is another infrastructure as code, but it uses actually basically a full programming language to, to define resources. And we've actually seen uh, some other tools doing similar things. So we've actually seen, I think there's, a, there's a, someone's done that, some of the same thing Terraform as C Sharp. As well. so yes. Terraform, CDK, um, the other cloud providers got CDK, but it's something similar. Gotcha. Talk if you want to, oh, that would be, see, we've, right, okay, by the way, yeah, if you ever want to give talks, yes, that we'd love to have you, but yeah, if you're keen, that would be good. So, so yeah, I, to be honest, I'm not experienced in Pulumi, but I have seen the other CDK as you're talking about, and I know there is a, there is some, some work being done on something similar for Azure, but again, it's, it's kind of a, it's an, I see it as, it's a, it's not as commonly used, but it has some really good uh, use cases. So if you are, you know, if you've got strong codes, if you've got, if you need to deploy or create resources, it's easier to, you might be stronger to use, you know, code, write unit tests and automation, you know, to build up your infrastructure that way. So I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to say this is better than it, but it's certainly, you're going to see this used more often because most, you know, not all infrastructure pros are, you know, really going to be comfortable jumping in and, and writing a bunch of code. Cool. Um, then is Dan able to commit his demo.bicep file to his GitHub repo? Um, I can't find it in there. I will do that. Thank you very much. That, yeah, I can. The question was, can I commit this to my bicep repo? I think I've got put an empty repo. Yes, I will. I will do all my sample files there. Um, and including my my usual presentation and all that sort of stuff. Cool. I'll to yes to that one. And question with that. Um, so this isn't really a bicep question. It's just a arm question. When do we get like diffing visualization tools? Ah, so this is a question about when do we get diffing visualization for ARM templates in the portal? Isn't it? Doesn't it already exist? Hang on, I'm trying to remember. I what if on the, the CLI? Isn't yeah, you got what if on the CLI. Now, was, well, I know what you're talking about. There was actually going to be a visualization component where you can do a what if in the portal and it would give you a big green box and say, this is going to be added. That I remember that was that was demoed a while back, but I know what you mean. I don't think I, do, I don't it's think it's going to It's a good question. That is an excellent question. Picture. So what it would do is it would say, well, it was kind of visual what if. Um, and that was planned. But I mean, you can still do the same thing. I think what if output has actually got color coding. So, have you familiar with what if? Yeah, I've seen it. It's a bit yeah, limited. Like um, yeah, yes. Yeah. Armvis.io as well. It's quite handy. That website. Um, you got armvis.io, and then you upload the arm template, and it draws it out for you. Yeah, it's a Google yeah but the the diff, do it if you do a what if and and in uh, the terminal or whatever. So add what if to the end of your um, deployment function, it will, so if you're using PowerShell, uh, it will actually give you an output and say, I'm going to add this, similar to a Terraform um, Terraform plan command. I think that's kind of similar to AWS SAM CLI, if anyone has used, like yeah. you can uh, do SAM deployment pass a flag and, and the output it says, this is what would happen. Yes. Is, is that kind of what you're? Yeah, I'm thinking more of of like a, a tool that visualizes like, the resources in like little icons. Oh, that's, that's yeah, the difficult. Like actually, show yeah. executives. Isn't there a visualization of bicep like, as well? Yeah, yeah it could be. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, so on Twitter this morning, somebody was saying that there's a bicep visualization extension. I think. Is it that? 
Okay, well, that'd be, that's, uh, that'd be another. Thank you. Thank you. I think probably given next, given next week, probably after next week, you should be able to do, do even more demos on vice <laughs> Um Given, of course, build next week. Um, does Bicep allow you to kind of do something like Terraform plan where it tells you, it tracks the state of your existing infrastructure with your previous deployment, and then says, actually, I'm going to change these things before you actually learn it underneath the water but super good question now this is probably this we could go down into a rabbit hole most of tabs and spaces kind of thing but um the question was does is there something closer to a, a terraform plan for for bicep and where a terraform plan will basically say look based on the last time i thought you deployed these resources this was the state when i deployed them um and i want to i want you to tell me if you deploy this or plan to deploy this, these changes now, this is what's going to happen. Now, the answer is no, because there's actually no concept of a state with BICEP. Now, that is a good and a bad thing, because the challenge, and this is where the argument comes, comes for the approach that Terraform has, is that Terraform does record a state separate to the actual deployment, to the infrastructure. Now, in a perfect world, I would never go in and change the infrastructure in Azure outside of Terraform. That would just be a no-no. Why would I do that? That's drift. But we know that doesn't always happen. So what happens is you end up with a Terraform state that isn't in fact the same as the actual Terraform, the actual resources deployed. So when you do a plan, it says, well, I think this is what's going to happen. But when you actually do it, it's not, it, it doesn't actually do that. But that's, these are all trade-offs. So what if is close to that, but it, instead of, instead of looking at what the state was when you last deployed, it is actually asking Azure Resource Manager, what is the current state? So again, it's the source of truth, multiple sources of truth argument. But again, it's a, it's an edge case, and in a perfect world, we would never touch infrastructure by way of any anything other than code. But we know that the world is not perfect. Yeah. Uh, can you have a resource group resource defined as a module too? Yes, you can. You you can. Now that is. There's a there's a, mo a learn module coming up showing that. I didn't go get into the details of all the other modules, but there are other types of resources we didn't talk about. So the ability to do subscription deployments and deploy other objects, which we've traditionally had to do nested deployments for. So resource groups, I think there's policy. Do you, I keep looking at Shahid. Shahid's a BMP, so he just know all the stuff. Uh, no, um, there's things like, um, there's deployments of other, base resources like policy subscriptions resource groups so yes the answer is yes wait till the learn module or you can go into the docs on github and just it's pretty clear it's easy in there Jade? does it do some validation on some of the parameters so for example storage accounts can't be between three and 24 characters does indeed spaces. yes it does it, it, yeah it does and there's a there is a few tricks is it kind of an expression called any which sometimes you have to override the th what Bicep thinks because Bicep sometimes says, well, the API says this is a string, but it's in fact an integer. <laughs> um, so you need to be aware that Bicep will do all this checking for you, even you know, even if you don't want it to, and sometimes you need to tell it off, tell it not to, because there are a few conditions. But yeah, it'll check the parameters for the, the you know the limitations of them things. But of course, you've got to be aware that if you've done it created that as an expression, asking a parameter, it may not be able to figure out that. Yeah. So kind of following on my previous question, um, but more to the property of ARM templates with the Indo photo, as in if you deployed a template with a certain configuration and you changed it and you deployed it again, it would like it could switch uh, a configuration item. But with Bicep, let's say you deployed three tags and then you wanted to change what your total number of tags was. If you added another tag, would it just deploy four, like three different <laughs> tags and you did it with four? So there's, the question is about item potency of Bicep and whether if I, if I say have a, you know, I'm deploying a resource, it's got three tags and I add another one, is it going to deploy four tags? That is, that is a good question, but it's it's got to act the same way as Azure Resource Manager templates do, because it's, as I said, it's going to compile down and it's going to do, do a, run the exact same thing. So I think that is also controlled on basically on whether you're doing, a, I think it's um, whether you're doing a 
incremental or a complete deployment. It's a complete, can we complete? You remember? You never do <laughs> complete ones. So. <laughs> yeah, so it will, it, but it will put it into the state. So it will, it, it tries in 99% of the cases, it will be an item, item potent um, uh, deployment. It won't change things that don't need to be changed. There are a couple of exceptions, and you may may or may not ever run into them. But so can I? Was... Well, yeah, well, seven o'clock. We yeah, one last question, then we better wrap it. So on that same note, that uh, it basically will do the same as as Arm, as, as you just said. Uh, does bicep somehow improve the debugging experience? Because uh, I think we've all been there. Like uh, something fails, and we try to look at the error logs, and it's not very descriptive. So. Does bicep somehow improve? That? Unfortunately, not. No, a no, no, bicep will. So the question is, will that improve the experience of after you've deployed the template and it goes, no, sorry, cryptic error number one three four five. Um, you did something wrong. Unfortunately, no. But the ARM team will always be working on that. The, the, the team that looks after ARM, the engine, will always be working to improve that. So um, I think those will always get better. But I, yeah, unfortunately. I have, to, I have to work out how to attach the debugger. Uh, one day, one day, yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah, it may, it may happen. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Look, I really appreciate everyone coming along tonight. It's been awesome. <laughs> Stick is up here, grab some stickers, just randomly in my head, so yeah. And thank you, everyone, online for coming. That's awesome, awesome to see. And I can oh. say, don't forget, it's build next week. So if you haven't registered, go and register. <laughs> And if you want to present, it's easy. I'm going to say, you don't get it. 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 You and there are some funny stories about yeah. You should email Tommy yeah. and some other time to catch up. Yeah. 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 But the problem is, yeah. it's probably a little bit short. Yeah. 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 The problem here is it's not just motor cloud, is you also have third party providers that have that have terrible providers that you can automate like Let's say, for example, oh, uh, so it's uh, my spun up an AKS instance. I don't know how to the period in the text. So I used to use a better interpretation. I to provision my ingress, my services, my all my Kubernetes resources. And then if I have a hub I use the hub to deploy, let's say, external DNS or a manager to release 
Check my Cabernet's cluster. Yeah. Yeah. That just happens. Uh, what's, what's the brand of like, things? These are just like. No, it's not. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's like, uh, you know, a lot of stuff. This is what we did previously in the Cobra, and you didn't have a gross provider. You didn't have a provider. What you do is you do not allow resources calling a script that does that. And yeah, it's not pretty. Still not handing over that to anyone. Because now you have to maintain that script as well. In here, because you are, you're and using a provider. Script, you don't get the state. Yeah, as well, yeah, exactly. So you're, you're, you're as good as I'm. Yes. 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 I'm going to get a stick yeah. on. Yeah. 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 Put on my laptop. Yeah, it would be nice. Like, like, I really like the stick shots. I just got a new work laptop. Yeah, I really would like to have some special questions. It's just so brandy. I just chill out. I'm the most efficient piece of the time. The most efficient piece of the time. I still don't really